So welcome everybody to the hills. We're glad to have you here this morning. We're glad to see your faces. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Awesome. It was a little lagging from this side of the room, not throwing anybody under the bus or anything. But, but look, how about this side? Stay quiet. We try this side. Good morning, everybody. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Thank you guys. We appreciate it. Well, we are glad to have everybody here. It is a beautiful day today. It is the Lord's Day. He gave us this day to come together to worship, to praise, to glorify, to honor Him. And that's why we're here. And we are glad to have you here. We are glad to be able to come together. And as always, we want to know what God's got going on in your life. If there's something you're struggling with, if there's something that you're excited about, something that you have praises, or you're a little concerned about a decision that you've made or need to make, whatever it is, we want to know what God's doing in your life and how we can come together with you. So if you're here in person, grab one of us or grab one of the connect cards from the back. One of these things. Fill it out. Let us know what God's got going on in your life. Drop it in the box in the back. Or you can go to the website, www.thehillsporterville.com, and click prayer. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know what's going on. Also, we have three ways to obediently give of our tithes and gifts and offerings here you can either grab one of the envelopes, drop your gift in there and stick it in the box in the back, or you can go to thehillsporterville.com, click give, follow the prompts there, or you can text your gift to 84321. Before we get started, let's open in prayer this morning. Father God, we love you, and we are thankful to be in your house today. We are thankful to be your children. We are thankful to be your church. And we are thankful to be able to glorify and honor you today. We hope that this offering of our lives and our service to you is pleasing to you. We hope, Lord, that our gift will be a fragrant offering that will bring a smile to your face today. Lord, we know because your word promises it that where two or three are gathered in your name that you are there. So we know you are here in your house this morning. And we just ask this morning that you would commune with us today. That you would walk around this room and touch each one of us. Touch those that are listening online. Let us feel your presence today, Lord. We lift up all of the the different things going on in our world. You know everything that's going on. You know the struggles that we each have personally, and you know the struggles that we are dealing with socially. Lord, we lift them all to you, and we ask, as Jesus did, that while we may have desires of the way we want things, not our will, but your will be done. We trust you and that your will is best and that your will be done. And we thank you for that. Lord, as we worship you today, I ask that the words that come from my mouth today be your words. I ask you to speak clearly through me, not only to me, but to everyone in this room and everybody listening today, live and later on. Lord, we want to understand your word, prepare our hearts to receive the message that you have for us today and allow us to apply it in our lives. We just love you so much and we ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. All right, well, as I said, today we're going to be talking about love. We just passed Valentine's Day, right? We just passed this time of year when everybody's been talking about love. We see hearts all over the place. We see flowers being sold all over the place at exorbitant prices. We see candy boxes and chocolates in high demand. And then the day after Valentine's Day, everything goes on super sale, and that's when the real holiday starts, right? But 
What was that? National Hippo Day. Yeah, National Hippo Day. Yeah. A lot of people feel like this time of year we have to try our best to use this season as a time specifically to celebrate love. But today I'd like for us to take a look at love in itself and ask the question of how we as Christians represent what love really is. Now, I'm going to continue talking for uh, just a minute, but while I'm talking, because I'm going to read a couple of passages of Scripture, I'd like you to turn to them and be, or write them down to look at them later, but I'd like you to be able to turn to these passages. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 7 and Romans chapter 2. We're going to look at Matthew first. But turn to those passages, Matthew chapter 7 Romans chapter 2, we're going to start verse 1 on both of those passages. So Matthew 7 and Romans 2. I just want to give you a chance to turn to them really fast. For those of you that are looking, Matthew is the beginning of the New Testament. And then you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. So the sixth book of the New Testament is Romans. Matthew is the first. A poll was done by the Barna Research Group that showed that only one out of five non-Christian young adults say that they consider the church to be a loving environment. That's a pretty sad number, wouldn't you say? One out of five young adults, non-Christians, say that they think the church is a loving environment. And for an unchurched youth, that number is even lower. So we need to ask ourselves, why is that? People on the outside looking in at Christians consider us to be hypocritical and judgmental. Why? Simple answer, because oftentimes we are. A lot of times we are. The word hypocrite comes from an old Greek word that refers to the wearing of a mask. In fact, one of the definitions of hypocrite is one who puts on a mask and pretends to be what they are not. So, in fact, the Bible itself warns us about being a hypocrite. In fact, in the King James Version, the word hypocrite is found 20 different times talking about us being hypocrites. And we talked about that folks think that the church is a hypocritical, Christians are hypocritical and judgmental. So what about judgmental? Judgmental goes hand in hand with being a hypocrite. Turn with me now. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1. And for those of you that are reading along, you may see in your Bible that the words are written in red. The words written in red are denoted as being quotes from Jesus. So these are the words of Jesus, a direct quote basically from him. Starting in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, it says, Don't judge others or you will be judged. You will be judged in the same way that you judge others. And the amount that you give to others will be given to you. Why do you notice the little piece of dust in your friend's eye, but you don't notice the big piece of wood in your own eye? How can you say to your friend, let me take that little piece of dust out of your eye? Look at yourself. You still have that big piece of wood in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, Take the wood out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the dust out of your friend's eye. Pretty telling passage of Scripture there, right? So now let's look at Romans. Romans chapter, chapter 2, sorry. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1 says, if you think you can judge others, you are wrong. When you judge them, you are really judging yourself guilty. 
Because you do the same things they do. God judges those who do wrong things, and we know that His judging is right. You judge those who do wrong, but you do wrong yourselves. Do you think you will be able to escape the judgment of God? So what do we see from those passages? We get so tied up in our little religious lives that we can't see all the sin in our own lives. We are so quick to point the finger at others. And one of my dad's favorite sayings is that for every time you point a finger at somebody else, you've got three fingers pointing back at you. When you're pointing your finger at somebody else, I'm pointing my finger at you right now, Ginger. I got these bottom three fingers pointing right back at me. So for the one thing I'm pointing at you, I got three pointing right back at me. Right? We get so tied up and we can so easily point the finger at somebody else. Did you know that 87% of young non-Christians aged 18 to 34 say that the term judgmental accurately describes present-day Christians? 87%. And we wonder why we don't attract young folks to our churches today. Dr. W.A. Criswell was the pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas. And he was the pastor there for a number of years. Some of you may recognize the name Criswell. There's a very large Bible college. The Criswell Bible College in Dallas, Texas has been a seminary for years and years and years teaching pastors preparing pastors and youth pastors and music leaders and, and folks that work and feel the calling in the church. And one day, Dr. Criswell was talking to his son, and he said that if he ever had a moral lapse in his life and it caused him to sin, that he hoped no one in the church would find out. Because according to Dr. Criswell, quote, Christians are the most unforgiving and judgmental people on the face of the earth. We sit in our pews and in our homes and we judge people. We go to Walmart and we judge people because of the way people look or dress. An author by the name of Philip Yancey once said, having spent time around sinners and also around self-proclaimed saints, I have a hunch why Jesus spent so much time with the sinners. I think he preferred their company because the sinners were honest about themselves and they had no pretense. Jesus could deal with them. In contrast, the saints put on airs. They judged him and sought to catch him in a moral trap, and in the end it was the saints, not the sinners, who arrested Jesus. Think about that for a second. See, Jesus spent time with the sinners. He had compassion on people. The word compassion comes from two Latin words, cum and passio. The word cum means with, and the word passio means to suffer. So literally the word compassion means to suffer with. Jesus suffered with sinners. He suffered with the people that he was dealing with. He had compassion because he understood people's problems. He loved them despite their problems and hang-ups. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to look at, we're now talking, it says that Jesus loved them, right? He had compassion on them and he loved them despite their problems and hang-ups. So let's look at what love is. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4. This is what is known as the love passage of Scripture. It's a definition of love. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous. It does not brag. And it is not proud. Love is not rude, is not selfish, and does not get upset with others. 
Love does not count up wrongs that have been done. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices over the truth. Love patiently accepts all things. It always trusts, always hopes, and always endures. Love never ends. There are gifts of prophecy, but they will be ended. There are gifts of speaking in different languages, but those gifts will stop. There is the gift of knowledge, but it will come to an end. The reason is that our knowledge and our ability to prophesy are not perfect. But when perfection comes, the things that are not perfect will end. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I stopped those childish ways. It's the same with us. Now we see a dim reflection as if we were looking into a mirror. But then we shall see clearly. Now I only know a part but then I will know fully, as God has known me. So these three things continue forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love talking about love today. We all have loved ones. But what about those people who have lost loved ones and then have a tragedy such as a fire or a tornado or even a hurricane that happens to them after losing somebody, right? Those people now have lost the pictures and the heirlooms that they used to remember their loved ones by. Now all they have left is love. Right? They don't have the, the physical things anymore. They've got love. But love will last forever. Love conquers all. We have to have a heart of compassion if we are truly going to serve people as Christ did. We have to love. There's a lot of great love stories in the world. Some of you may have your own love story. Maybe how you met your spouse. Maybe those little things that make them so special. All sorts of stories like that, but to me, the greatest love story in the world it's found in the scripture, and we're going to look at that today. It's a passage pretty much all of you know. A lot of folks that don't even attend church know this passage of scripture. We're going to look at John 3.16. But we're not just going to look at John 3.16. We're going to follow it up with verse 17 as well. So John 3.16, to me, is the greatest love story ever told. It says, God so loved the world. He loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son so that whoever believes in Him may not be lost, but have eternal life. God did not, his, did not send His Son into the world to judge the world guilty, but to save the world through Him. God loved us so much that He sent Jesus not to judge us, but to save us. God has so much love for us that He sent His Son to die for us. And a lot of folks will look at this passage and say, God so loved the world. Is He talking about are, are we talking about the world? Are we talking about the planet that we live on? No, he's talking about the people. 
And the reason I know he's talking about the people is you look at Genesis and the creation story. Yes, he created the world and everything in it. He created the universe and everything in it. But the one thing that he did that we can see clearly in that creation story is that with the universe and the earth and the mountains and the oceans and the sun and the moon and every plant and animal, it says that he spoke and said, let these things be with man, with people. He actively took a role. It says that he came and physically formed us out of the dust of the ground and then breathed life into us. He took an active role in creating us because he loved us, because he wanted us to be special. He wanted us to have a relationship with him. God loved us so much that he sent his son. Now, as you parents out there know, having a child changes our whole view of life and death. Our children mean the world to us. The only thing that we fear worse than losing them is for something to happen to us and those kids having to grow up without their parent. But we need to know today that we have a Father who will never, ever leave us. He loves us so much that He sent Jesus. He would only leave us if He didn't care about us and our problems, but He sent His Son to die for our sins. And I think that alone shows that He cares and loves us still today. We looked at John 3.16. Let's look a couple of passages back past that at John 15. John chapter 15, starting in verse 9. And again, these words are written in red. John 15, verse 9, says, I loved you as the Father loved me. Now remain in my love. I have obeyed my Father's commands, and I remain in his love. In the same way, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. I have told you these things so that you can have the same joy I have, and so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. This is my command. Love each other as I have loved you. The greatest love a person can show is to die for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. You did not choose me. I chose you and I gave you this work to go and produce fruit fruit that will last then the father will give you anything you ask for in my name this is my command love each other Jesus gave, a, gave us a command there didn't he what was it say it with me love each other Love one another. Say it again. Love, Love one another. What are we supposed to do? Love one another. Love one another. How can Christ shine through us if we don't love those around us? Are you following Christ's command? Do you truly love others? And when I say love others, I don't just mean your family. I mean your neighbors. I mean your co-workers. I mean other people that you come in contact with. Not only other people that you come in contact with at the grocery store or the gas station or wherever. The scripture also tells us that we need to love our enemies. The book of 1 John chapter 4 starting in verse 7 says, Dear friends, 
we should love each other because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has become God's child and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, then we have to love one another. Otherwise, we're sinning. There is a story that I heard one time about a little boy named Johnny who was visiting his grandparents and he was given his first slingshot. He practiced in the woods, but he could never hit his target. Practiced and practiced and practiced, and then he decided to go back to the house. And as he's going back into Grandma's backyard, he saw her pet duck, and as little boys often do, on an impulse, he just took aim and let fly. And of course, what happened, right? Obviously, he never could hit his target, but the one time that he is just impulsively shooting at Grandma's pet duck, the stone hit home. And the duck fell, right? So, all of a sudden, understandably, Johnny panicked. And desperately, he went and grabbed the duck, and he hid the duck in the woodpile, only to look up and see his sister Sally watching him. Sally had seen everything, but she didn't say anything. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, you know what? Johnny said he wanted to help in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? <laughs> and then she whispered to Johnny, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later that evening, Grandpa says, hey kids, you want to go fishing? And Grandma says, well, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help me make supper. Sally smiled and says, that's all taken care of. Johnny said he wants to do it today. And then she turns to Johnny and whispers, remember the duck. So Johnny stayed. Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's chores, he couldn't stand it anymore, and he confessed to Grandma that he killed the duck. And Grandma says, I know Johnny. He gave him a hug and said, I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you. I just wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. Don't let sin make a slave of you. It can be easy to do, right? We've all gotten caught up with that. If we're not careful, bless you, if you're not careful, we can have hatred for others build up in our hearts through something called judgment. And it's sin that's building up and it just grabs hold of us, right? And we can get caught in that net, caught in that cycle of sin and become slaves to it. We become the judge of the world and the people around us. But if we don't have love in our hearts, something is wrong. The greatest commandment that Jesus gave us was to love God, which Jesus is God, right? He said, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, right? So love God, and the second command that he said was like it, was love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as yourself, and as Christians, we have to get along. There should be nothing but love for Christ and for your neighbor, and I know in this world that we live in, we hear, love God with your everything, love your neighbor, and then we have to sit there and say, yeah, that's great to say and everything, but putting it in practice is really hard because 
You know that coworker of mine, he's really hard to love. I don't know that I can, right? Or man, I've got that sister. She just, she gets on my nerves all the time. She makes every wrong decision. She makes my life miserable. How can I love her? Or man, I got that neighbor that lives across the street from me that every time that I need to get up early the next day, that's when they decide they're going to throw a big party and crank that party and the music up until 3 o'clock in the morning and I have to try to sleep through it. They got all their friends that are parking on my lawn and dropping all their litter on my lawn and making noise till all hours. How can I love them? Guess what? They are your neighbor, and God said, love them. Jesus said, love your neighbor. He didn't say, love your neighbor when it's nice and it's easy. He said, love your neighbor. If you're holding on to a grudge today, if you're holding on to judgment today, if you are holding on to sin, if you are being a slave to sin today, Now's the time to let go of it. Because God loved you and me so much. And he knew everything that we were doing. Right? We read in that passage earlier that God knows us and everything about us completely. And eventually we'll know like God does. But God knows us. Every time I'm pointing my finger, remember three, point, three fingers pointing back at me? God knows everything that is in those three fingers pointing back at me. He loves me. None of that. None of that. She's not holding it against you either, Josh. God loves you so much even though he knows those fingers pointing back at you. He loves you so much and wants a relationship with you so much that He sent Jesus who lived a perfect, sinless life, deserved no judgment whatsoever, to climb up on that cross and accept judgment in your place, in my place. God paid the price for us so that we didn't have to so that we would not be lost, so that we would not perish. We could have eternal life. We could have eternal relationship with Him. We could have family with Him. The Scripture says that when we accept Him and the sacrifice that He made, when we believe in Jesus, that right then and there we are forgiven. And the scripture also says that our forgiveness with God, he puts that forgiveness as far as the east is from the west, away from him. So he doesn't remember it. We, ladies, I'm not trying to throw you all under the bus here, I promise. But we, we as people tend to do this, and women, I, I've seen in my life, women really tend to do this, where they'll say, I forgive you. And then five years down the line, they'll take whatever it was and throw it right back up in your face because you didn't forget about it, right? It's hard to forget, but God gives us the example of how we are supposed to live, and that is to forgive and forget. Put it as far away as possible so that it's like it never happened. That's how we're supposed to love that's the example that we have been given of how we need to love. We need to let Jesus and the love of Jesus shine through us. We love as He loved. That's what we need to do. So we're going to close today. But for those of you that are already inheritance holders, Children of God. Ask yourself, am I being a slave to sin? 
Am I loving like I should? Am I representing love in this world? Or am I representing hypocrisy and judgment? Am I representing the king or am I representing myself? We talk every week. We say, the church is not this building. It's us, right? We are supposed to represent the king. We are supposed to look into this world around us and see a bunch of folks that we need to love. Because God loved the world so much. He didn't just love certain groups. He didn't just love certain people. I know as much as we'd like to say, yeah, well, God didn't really mean that, right? He loved the world so much that he gave Jesus. How are you representing love in this world today? If you're, not, if you're not loving like you should, that's fine. I don't think the majority of us are. I know I'm guilty as anybody else of not loving as I should. But today, we as children have the opportunity to take a fresh start and say, God, forgive me for not loving like I should. Help me to love better. Help me to love like you love. Help me to represent the king. Help me that this world around me would see Jesus and his love shining through me. Help me to do better. Give me a fresh start. And he will because he's wonderful that way and he loves us. So he gives us as many fresh starts as we need. For those of you that are here in the room or watching online that maybe have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, have never believed in Jesus and accepted that love gift of God. What are you waiting on? You were loved so much by God. You are loved so much by God that He sent Jesus to pay your price. To give you an inheritance. When Jesus ascended, he said, I'm going to prepare a place in my Father's house for you. He's waiting for us. Eternity in the Father's house is waiting for us. So, we're going to close in prayer here in just a second. But as we pray... If you need to make that decision today, I'm going to pray and I want you to pray along with me. For those that need to make a fresh start, just ask for it. You know God gives them. You know He's listening. You know He's there and He wants to forgive you because He forgave you already. He sent Jesus once and for all. That means He doesn't have to send Jesus again no matter how bad we sin. He sent him once to pay the price for all of us. So let's pray. Father God, we love you. And Lord, I pray today for those that are listening to give them an example of how to pray, Lord. And I ask that you would hear their prayers. Jesus died. God, you loved us so much that you sent him to die. I admit, Lord, that I am a sinner. I admit that I messed up, that I have continued to sin and fall short of your standards. But I know that that's why you sent Jesus, because you loved me so much that you sent him to die in my place. That whoever believes in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he was perfect and died to pay my price. To take my place in punishment. To take the judgment that should have been on me. 
because I know those three fingers that point back at me. And I know what they are. And I know I messed up. I ask you to forgive me. I believe in Jesus. And I, from, this stick, from this day forward, I ask for a fresh start. I ask, Lord, for you to help me live under his sacrifice. To live under his grace. To live under his love. I declare today that Jesus is Lord of my life. He is in charge. He is in control from this day forward. And I know I'm going to continue to mess up because I'm not perfect, Lord, but you are. And I ask for your help to help me to live better every day, to represent Jesus and his love every day. To love as you love, God. To love as Jesus loved. He said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life. Help me to love like Jesus. Help me to love even the hard folks, even the neighbors even the co-workers, even the family members that can be hard to love, help me to love like Jesus loved. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the fresh starts. We thank you for the reminders. We thank you for the help that we need from time to time to love better, to do better. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for your love. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. All right, as I say all the time, I'm glad that you were able to be here today. And I hope that whether it is introspection where God asks, laid something on your heart through this message and you have a decision that you need to make today to make a fresh start or for the first time to accept Jesus as your Savior or whatever it is that you're struggling with, come reach out to one of us after the service or reach out through the comment section or through the website or email or whatever. Reach out to us to let us know how that we can come together with you, how we can lift you up. And until next week, we were commanded to love each other, right? And as his church, we are supposed to represent him. He loved, he, he loved every one of us. He loved his neighbors. He loved the sinners. He loved the world. So this week, we need to go and love each other. It was commanded, right? Love each other. What was that again? Love each other. So this week, remember this building is not the church. We are the church. So go and be the church. God bless you. We'll see you next week.